Today's episode of The Unseen Hour is sponsored by prismgram.com. Don't you hate the post office? I know I do. It's all the people and the queuing and the quietness. All the shelves and racks of things and the pens on chains and, and those little sponges with the... God, I hate the post office! I really hate it! It makes me angry! I hate it! I hate it! I hate it! Bastards! And by stupor mattresses. I used to sleep on a normal mattress, but ever since I received my stupo mattress, I've known I could never go back to that. Having the right mattress is so important. We spend a third of our lives in bed, and once you receive your stupo mattress, it'll be much more than that. Even better, try the stupor mattress free for 100 nights. And if you're not completely satisfied, on the 101st night, stupor will come to your house. Stupor mattresses. Sleep <laughs> like you'll never wake up. We love making the unseen hour. And we love bringing it to you for free. And for a very, very reasonable £10 ticket fee at the live show. But the show isn't free to make. The advertising you just heard was made up. The writer's imagination runs on an old coin-operated meter, and the actors require almost constant physiotherapy to ease their neck strain from supporting their enormous heads. You can help support us at patreon.com slash unseen hour. That's patreo dot com slash U-N-S-E-E-N-H-O-U-R. The badges are lovely. We have them for sale at the live show. This part, by the way, is entirely real. If you can't spare any money, you can help us by rating and reviewing us online. One listener described the Unseen Hour as an old pair of boots. <laughs> you can write literally anything on there. Sky's the limit, doesn't have to make sense, so uh, leave us a review. We'll love it if you do. Dude, tell me what it all means, me. Shut your eyes. Stop your ears. Yeah. No, no, you must get away from here. What's going on? I don't understand. It's not an easy thing to understand for such an enormous imbecile. What do you want to know? Human of frogs and frogs. frogs, frogs. <laughs> I have so many regrets. The first time I heard the podcast, I thought it must be some kind of cruel ruse. But when I started to investigate, I learned that it was much, much more. For the Carcos Broadcasting Company and Unseen Things Productions, I am Rufus Strideforth, and this is the Unseen Hour Files. I received an anonymous note suggesting that I listen to a particularly obscure internet phenomenon, a podcast called The Unseen Hour. I quickly learned that it was a kind of radio drama featuring a fictionalized version of me. That's when I began my investigation and opened The Unseen Hour files. Now, if you've never listened to this show before, don't worry, I'll get you up to speed. The notes from my first researches are both concise and very, very erudite. I've asked my friends and producers here at the station, Flem and Sob, to read some extracts. Not only are they representing me without my permission, they have also distorted my true character, rendering me as a cartoonish, cowardly fool who is often victim and or cause of cataclysmic events. <coughs> I... I have made contact with an internet cyber jockey named M.O.J. Perch. She is mysterious and very rude, but she's given me some useful leads. I'm going to investigate the online sources of the podcast. The Twitter, like the website, appears to be just a hollow front operated by an improbable, squeaky-voiced Cockney stoolie. I can't find anyone who knows anything. <sighs> I've made a great discovery... There's no time to write it down. I will make further notes on my triumphant return after breaking this case wide open. That, dear listeners, is the final entry. 
I would love to share with you the world-shaking discovery I had made, but the reason I am relating these events through the lens of my insightful and engaging notes is that I have no memory of this investigation whatsoever. <laughs> ah, that's right. I did, however, have one good lead. This hacker, M.O.G. Perch, in my notes was her name. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this hacker, Emoji Perch, in my notes her name was Screen Name, was always surrounded by little hearts and carefully rendered cherubim. I inferred that she was deeply besotted with me. Yes, what do you want? I didn't have much difficulty tracking her down. I'm a professional freelance investigative journalist, after all. It's what I do. <laughs> Hello, Emoji Perch. It's, it's me, Rufus Stryforth. I know who it is. Oh, well, you do? Yes, you do. That's very clever. Listen, the shack you visited last week is gone. It just vanished into thin air. I see. There's something else. The Unseen Hour? No. About the moon landings. Moon landings! Of course it's about the Unseen Hour. We only talk about the Unseen Hour. I see. She is rude. One of my keyword searches threw up some new results. A professor at Carcass University just published a paper on folklore called Origins of Oberon, an enumeration of the ethereal occupants of oblique outskirts. Ooh, ooh, ooh. It contains a reference to the Unseen Hour. Oh, but, but, but that's wonderful news! <laughs> Why, thank you so... Oh. I was on the job again. The scent of adventure in my nostrils. I was heading to meet Professor Elmore Kent of Carco's University. Are uh, you... Do understand that uh, <laughs> none of this is real. More from Professor Kent after this brief tonal contrast. <laughs> the Fatberg became sentient at approximately 5:37 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time. It was being pummeled by high-pressure jets of icy grey water, the streams of which were being brutally administrated by a half-dozen high-vis-vested Thames Water employees. A congealed mass of fat, excrement, tampons, used condoms, and soiled wet wipes, roughly the size of a blue whale. The Fatberg's first sensation is one of pain, agony. It can feel tiny pieces of itself being chipped away by the water cannons. Eroded, its sides are jammed up against the walls of the Dickensian sewer tunnel. It is stuck, tight, and yet desperate to escape its current predicament, the Fatberg feels something growing inside of it. An urge, a desire to make a break for freedom. Summoning its deepest reserves of inner strength, the Fatberg wills itself into motion, powered by its own deranged psychic momentum. It smashes past the jet streams, the Thames water workers smearing a few of them along the cobbled walls as it careens headlong down the sewage system. After an eternity of labyrinthian tunnels and fecal matter, the Fatberg finally makes it to a pipe that flows into the river, sunlight glistening of its waxy surface as the Fatberg splashes into the churning waters. Within moments, the sound of sirens fills the air. Helicopters circle the skies. The river is lined with speedboats. Loudspeakers and foghorns blast in the direction of the Fatberg, and the chase is on. The current carries the Fatberg downstream, and along with its own strange force, it slices through the water at a tremendous pace. As the speedboats try to gain on it, the faint crackle of gunfire is followed by the dull prods of a few lead pellets digging into its hide, but the Fatberg has already become impervious to pain. It was born into it. <laughs> they pull alongside of the Fatberg, guns blazing, but with one quick whip of its colossal mass, a giant wave flips the boat over as if they were toys. Others try to chase it down, even a hovercraft. But by this point, the Fatberg is moving too fast. Even the helicopters can't keep up. The Thames barrier looms into sight, but the Fatberg does not let up for a moment. It just keeps on accelerating towards those metallic gates. With all its might, the Fatberg charges the barrier and punches straight through, leaving a tangle of twisted debris in its wake. And then, finally, it reaches the open ocean, the deep blue sea, freedom. The Fatberg rolls onto its back and just floats there in the salty water, warming itself in the sun. For the first time in its short life, it experiences peace. 
Years pass, the Fatberg travels the seven seas. It explores ice caps, <laughs> coral reefs, undisclosed island coves. It sinks to the darkest depths of the marina trench and encounters creatures no human has ever seen. Strange phosphorant jellies, tiger-striped giant squid, and leviathan sea monsters that dwarf its mass in comparison. The Fatberg is able to strike up a rapport with some of these species and for quite some time travel with a pod of bottlenose dolphins. <laughs> who seem perfectly content with life spent eating, fucking, and turning somersaults. All day long, they fuck each other. Their horniness knows no bounds. Some of them would even wrap live eels around their members and masturbate between the orgies. Such was their wanton lust. <laughs> the dolphins would often quiz the fatberg on its sexuality. What were its experiences, preferences? But the fatberg had long ago conceded that it was decidedly asexual, having neither the desire, the apparatus, nor any potential mate to begin with. This caused the Fatberg no grief or anxiety. It was simply a different path, one of solitude, but not loneliness. Nigel sat with the assault rifle resting on his prosthetic leg. Staring out of the side of the helicopter at the, ranging, at the raging depths of the West Indies below, ever since the incident, which had reduced his lifelong friends, Andrew and Paulie, to little more than a splodge of DNA dripping into the murky sewage beneath Whitechapel, Nigel had been hell-bent on exacting his revenge. It had taken him years, costing him his life savings and then some. But he finally managed to track down the fatberg to the waters surrounding the small Caribbean island of Antigua. Lightning and horizontal rain carve up the sky as 30 feet waves smash into each other in the eye of the tropical storm. Despite the pilot's repeated pleas to turn back, Nigel refuses. He's got the shadow of the giant filthy mass in his sights and he's not letting him get away. Not this time. It had taken his friends, his leg, and now he would take its life. He unloads a clip of ammunition at the floating shape, a hail of bullets causing the waters around it to explode. But the fatberg swims on. Nigel unloads clip after clip after clip after clip after clip. <laughs> Starts hurtling grenades to little effect. He orders the pilot to swoop down lower. The pilot tries to protest. It's just too dangerous. But Nigel won't hear it, orders him to get closer still. Then, with the pin of his final grenade between his teeth, a wall of water hits the side of the helicopter, causing it to spiral out of control. The grenade flies into the cockpit, rattles around beneath the pilot's seat. Nigel dives out just as it explodes. The flaming wreckage crashes into the sea. Plunging into the dark water, Nigel can hear the fatberg's moans. He's wounded it at least. He'll carve that bastard to pieces using the large hunting knife found in a specially tailored pocket in his life jacket. Like all Thames Water employees, he's passed his mandatory swimming tests. With flying colours, no less. He even got a pink certificate for his excellence in the 1,000 metre trial. But with the wounded Fatberg just a few feet away from his clutches at last, Nigel suddenly finds himself surrounded by a pod of dolphins. A super pod. Hundreds of them all circling, squeaking, taunting, laughing. A devilish glint in each one of their cold, black, glassy eyes. <laughs> then the dolphins start puncturing Nigel's wetsuit with their raging erections. They're on top of him in seconds, stabbing away with their members in a chorus of wailing delight. Nigel's corpse sinks to the bottom of the depths, leaving a misty trail of blood and semen. The storm clears. The dolphins and the fatberg rejoice. Soon the polar ice caps melt and the entire planet is covered in water. Earth becomes their playground, an orb of unlimited possibilities, unhindered by human interference. For centuries, millennia, they lead a life of pure joy in this aquatic Eden. Until eventually the sun explodes and, as Marx would put it, all that is solid melts into her. Professor Kent, you're the author of Origins of Oberon, an enumeration of the ethereal occupants of oblique ice skirts. Who are you? What can you tell me about folklore? I'm not going to tell you a thing if you're one of these lunatics who believes in fairies. It's, it's just fiction. The world is a cold, dull, mundane place. And there's no magic in it. <laughs> None. <laughs> now, now, Professor Kent, I'm, I'm a journalist. I have no interest in 
biases or prejudices. I deal only in even-handedly presented facts. <laughs> the only agenda I have is to starkly present the cold, hard, bare truth. Well, all right. <laughs> Journalists. What do you want to know about this absurd field in which I am an unwilling expert? Tell me a bite. The Unseen Hour. The Unseen Hour? Let me see. The story goes that the Unseen Hour, which is ironically only half an hour long, is a mysteriously uh, annoying sound. Once you hear it, they say you will be compelled to recommend it to your friends. And how would one go about finding it? It is guarded by a terrifying and powerful witch called Mama Yugchek, who is said to live in the wooded coastal regions of the Northwest. <laughs> That sounds like a lead to me. I feel I must reiterate that these are just stories. Bye! I hurried to the woods of the Northwest and began my search. In my enthusiasm, I did not prepare for survival in the wilderness. After four or five days of directionless peregrination, I was tired, hungry, cold, damp, and confused. Worse still... I was beginning to suspect that I was hopelessly lost in a completely ordinary forest. <laughs> it was then that something extraordinary happened. I saw through the trees a huge silhouette lurching towards me. At first, I thought it must be a building, but the way it moved was more like a, a large animal. It was then that I realized it was neither, or in some ways, both. <laughs> Before me stood a log cabin, balanced high upon two long leathery legs, like the legs of a duck. But instead of feet, each leg ended in an entire horse. <laughs> each horse standing upon four conclusory wheels. It matched in every detail the legendary hut of Mama Yagchek. <laughs> <laughs> you there! You, what are you doing wandering about my forest? She invited me inside, and I explained my investigation. Ah, uh, yes. The unseen hour. I can help you with this, but I will need something from you. Anything! I will take your kidney and part of your liver. My liver? Part of your liver! Don't be a baby, it grows back. <laughs> I tried to argue with her, but she insisted that she would only help me on receipt of my prized internal organs. Naturally, I value the truth higher than my own personal safety, but I was far from sure that I would even be allowed to leave without agreeing to her terms, since the cabin was now striding swiftly above the trees on its duck legs, skating on its wheeled horses towards the sea, surrounded by a flock of harmoniously wailing Andy Grieve. <laughs> Trail, lost the steering wheel crew Where the dust bowls are tearing through the night Somewhere off the coast Where the kids first overdose Where the sirens that are tearing through the night Picking up the pieces Running with the highs Looking for a cure That'll bring us back to life Wear a thousand faces Play a hundred parts Like a bullet to the heart When a girl like me Meets a boy like you Crying works and dreams are coming true When a boy like me Meets a girl like you the past you lit and tonight I roll with you Tonight I roll with you When the sun is high and the shadows long Distant sounds and highway songs The road stretches out, the story shall begin 
hidden lights in rogue cafes Where Vincent's nights meet and his days As a promise made, story shall begin again, again, again Picking up the pieces, running with the highs Looking for a cure that'll bring us back to life Where a thousand faces play a hundred parts Take a bullet to the When a girl like me meets a boy like you Fireworks and dreams are coming true When a boy like me meets a girl like you The past and later tonight are all with you I woke from a pleasant acoustic nap to find a message on my phone. Look, I've done some research into this Mama Yadchek character. It seems that apart from the non-specific Eastern European roots and the magic house that sounds like a broken neural network was set loose in a Lego, Lego factory, she's also known for eating the entrails of the innocents. Just be careful. The poor girl was plainly head over heels for me. <laughs> Lago factory. <laughs> But I had no time to consider, <laughs> to consider that. I was the guest of a mysterious hag who at this very moment seemed to be frying up some delicious smelling, if ironic, offal on the far side of her hovel. Thank you, honey. <laughs> They're quite delicious. You're quite welcome, you friendly crone. <laughs> I had no idea what she was talking about, and sadly, she didn't seem inclined to share her meal. Mm, oh, yum. <laughs> the, the spell is almost complete. I've brought you to the place where the woods meets the sea. From here, the demon I have summoned must be your guide. A demon! This was worrying. <laughs> you summoned a demon! Yo, that's me, hello! <laughs> In comes I, Lawrence Sebastian Fox, demon of the 23rd realm of the Inferno, yeoman of flies and frogs, expectorator of mischief, scourge of the immaculate city of Ugoglioth. The ancient cults know me as Epulithlotech the Bastard. The spacemen know me as Laser Fred. And in the waters at the edge of the world, I am known as the Frying Pan Man. <laughs> and I could go on, but that's just a bit about me there, in case you were wondering. <laughs> oh, terrible demon! Please, spare me! I will do anything! Take up, puny mortal! For I am doing a favour for my, my friend the witch. Hello! <laughs> and there's a, a, all sorts of secret and mystical laws, upshot of which I'm not, uh, I'm not allowed to hurt you in any way directly, okay? Okay. Right! Now hold still as I grasp you with my razor-sharp talon. Ah, this is a horrible experience! <laughs> and with that, the eight-foot-tall, bright-red demon with a face like a hellhind that's eaten a bee unfurled his leathery wings and lifted me out over the waves. Naturally, I was unruffled by these events, all in a day's work for an independent freelance investigative journalist. The brine in the air covered the scent of the journalistic integrity that was saturating my tweed trousers. <laughs> Finally, we arrived at our destination, a fishing trawler, the bounty of the sea, crew of one, a wild-eyed pygmy with disco hair and a plastic seashell brassiere. Oi! Get away, demon! Nothing for you here! All right, all right, no need to yell, just drop it off! Bye! It was then that I noticed that instead of fish, the boat was piled high with audio cassette tapes. For those of you who don't know what an audio cassette... Everyone knows what a cassette tape is, don't be ridiculous. If they don't know what a cassette tape is, they know what Google is! So I decided to question the captain. What do you want to know? The unseen hour. 
really a question there, but yes. These tapes are episodes of the excellent but sadly underappreciated cult hit podcast, The Unseen Air. But how? Who records them? Where do they all come from? From up there. From heaven? <laughs> no. Nah, there. <laughs> that balloon. There's an old man with a fine head of hair in a hot air balloon. He throws the tapes into the sea. I fish them out, pack them in crates, and then take them out to the desert where two excessively nondescript men put them into a van. Standard podcast production. Damn! If only that demon hadn't gone, I could fly up there and confront the man. Oh, I can help you with that. Here, step through this thatch. All right, hang on. What is it? It's a cannon. It's a... Oh! Oh! Gosh! Ooh! <laughs> oh. Hello there. A visitor. How nice. So you're the one behind all this. Behind all what, my dear fellow? The Unseen Hour! Oh, you're, you're interested in the tapes. Interested? <laughs> As of earlier today, and, and possibly even before that, I don't really remember, but... It has been my entire life's work to uncover the arcane secrets behind this creepypasta urban legend mystery. I will let nothing dissuade me. No sacrifice is too great on this heroic audio journey towards the truth. Oh, that's quite admirable, quite admirable. Uh, I only wish I could be of more help. But surely you can. You, you, you're part of it. The, the tapes are coming from up here. Do, do you make them? Where, 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 do you, where do they come from? Ah, well, uh, let me show you around. Uh, this is my balloon. Uh, isn't the wick work lovely? Mediocre. Uh, over here is the pile of rags where I sleep. And, and over here is the wormhole. A wormhole? That's right. Uh, a tear in the dimensional fabric fixed at this particular longitude, latitude, and altitude. <laughs> The unseen hour? Yes, yes, that's where it comes from. I put my little net in, like so, and when it comes back out, there's a cassette tape in it. Now, if you don't know what a cassette tape is... Yes, 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 enough of your little net. (laughs) Where do they come from? From in there. And then I put them in the sea. For heaven's sake, why? Why? Because it's my job. What purpose does it fulfill, man? Oh, now, we we can't go around interrogating every little thing. Uh, Sometimes we just have to accept that we're part of a system. It may not be a perfect system, or even one that makes even a glimmer of sense, but it's better than no system at all. I, I can't be held accountable for what's on the tapes and, I, and what people do with them. Uh, I simply perform my task. It, I take them from here, and I put them in the sea. I take them from here, and I put them in the sea. That's stupid! It's unbearable! As an ethically rigorous and politically... Woke, investigative journalist. <laughs> I cannot simply stand by while a, while a tired old man fails to realize that he should be miserable. The, the world is an awful place, and I will expose the roots of its corruption. Let me at that wormhole! No, don't touch it. Uh, any interference could turn it from a wormhole into a... No! Oh, a black hole! Oh, you're And so, as a direct result of our hero's attempts to put the world to rights, everything is sucked inside out and turned into spaghetti. And you too, dear listeners, must, um, figuratively, squeeze yourselves into the pasta of not listening to the show anymore. Until you emerge into the inconceivable tesseract of the next unseen hour. We hope that you enjoyed the bounty that was The Unseen Hour, episode 23, The Unseen Hour Files, Files. The Unseen Hour is recorded live every month at the Rosemary Branch Theatre in London, courtesy of Unattended Items. Check unseenhour.com for upcoming dates, both at the Rosemary Branch Theatre and at Vault Festival. It was performed brinally. 
by Bryce Stratford, Joey Timmons, and James Carney, and featured a monologue written by James King and performed by Ben Metcalf. The musical guest was Andy Grieve. Theme music by The Unrecorded. The Unseen Hour is an Unseen Things production, created, written, and produced by James Carney, and the podcast is produced in an undersea lair by Andy Goddard. <laughs> Unseen Things will be at Vault Festival in February with both The Unseen Hour in March and a brand new play <laughs> in February called The Thing That Came to Dinner, in which there is a thing, but it did not just come for dinner. Please talk to us on the internet. It makes us feel less alone. We look forward to seeing you all here again at the Unseen Hour. There is music is playing. Underwater liar, more like.